This video was made possible with the help of my lovely patrons. So the U.S. is going to host the 2026 Men's World Cup, the most watched sporting event in the world, unless you're from the U.S. ironically. Football, sir? Yes. It's a sport where you throw a ball with your hands. The final will be held at MetLife Stadium in my home state of New Jersey, even though you can't walk to and from the stadium as it's illegal to do so, and the stadium itself is in the middle of nowhere. Unlike soccer, or should I say football stadiums around the world that are mostly accessible by bus or public transportation, or wouldn't you know it by foot, to get to and from MetLife, you need to take the shuttle from Secaucus, the train station, or your hotel. The fact that the U.S., a country that calls football soccer a country that declares itself the world champions of a sport that only they participate in, a country that has multiple mass shootings a year that isn't walkable, is hosting an event for the international community that laughs at the U.S.'s very existence is mind-poggling. There's so many differences between the U.S. when compared to their international peers that you just wonder why the U.S. has to be so different. This was mocked in a recent SNL sketch called Washington's Dream, where they call out things the U.S. does that are truly nonsensical. For example, how the U.S. calls soccer football or not using the metric system and using Fahrenheit instead of Celsius, not to mention how the date is written in the U.S. Month, day, year. In most societies, the date is day, month, year, or year, month, day, either smallest to biggest or biggest to smallest. But month, day, year, just why? <laughs> The U.S. and Canada are also staunchly against using A4 paper and for some reason instead use 8.5 by 11 inch paper. By 1977, A4 was the standard letter format in 88 of 148 countries. Today, the standard has been adopted by all countries in the world except the U.S. and Canada. And finally, the U.S. uses the 12-hour clock system both orally and visually, while in most other countries they use the 24-hour clock and only use the 12-hour clock orally. To me, these idiosyncrasies make it seem as though the U.S. wants to give a big F you to the rest of the world by saying we're not like other countries and thinking that being willfully different makes them the best. In the viewer survey for this video, both groups from and outside of the U.S. agreed that the U.S. isn't the best country in the world. People within the U.S. described the country with mainly negative descriptors such as aggressive patriotism and Americans as being ignorant and loud. Responders outside of the U.S. also commented on the nation's odd lack of object permanence when it comes to the existence of other countries. When I personally think of the U.S., I think of the City Upon a Hill sermon by John Withrop, who declared that the U.S. colonies will be a beacon to the world, and how the quote was later used by various politicians to refer to American exceptionalism or this idea that the U.S. is somehow the best country in the world. But in reality, that exceptionalism is just a fancy word to justify why the U.S. government doesn't do things that most of the world does. And this extends far beyond the Fahrenheit and Celsius debate and into more serious issues like the death penalty, denying universal health care, little to no paid maternity leave, and more. The U.S. frames itself as going against the grain, marching to the beat of its own drum, but it does so at the expense of its own citizens. Many have highlighted the fact that though the U.S. is the richest country in the world, with the largest economy, largest military, and largest cultural impact, they, for some reason, haven't figured out a way to give their people free medical care. And though in the past, many people from the U.S. might have liked to believe the American dream was alive and well, and American exceptionalism was just plain old fact, I think for the past decade or more, those in the U.S. have begun questioning this truth more and more. As some respondents commented, I'm honestly still coming to terms with the fact that it's all a lie. It's so ingrained in you through your entire life, especially growing up in a conservative area. I've been surrounded by so many ethnocentric Americans my entire life. There wasn't a single moment when I became disenchanted with the U.S., but when I was little, I always thought of the U.S. as the default place to live and over time realized more and more the problems with the country that make it seem not very good compared to some other countries. But I definitely still think it is one of the better places in the world to live as long as you're not poor. For me, it was around 2020 when I saw how the government failed to properly respond to COVID. Others also noted that being marginalized in the U.S., they were already wary of the country. I'm queer and disabled. It's hard not to be skeptical of a country that treats me like shit. 
I'm black, so I've always been skeptical, but I was especially disenchanted between 2016 and 2022 when everything went to shit for real this time. More and more people are realizing that the white capitalist patriarchy we all live under only rewards people that the system is made for and how that's by design. If you're not rich and white and a product of generational wealth, no matter how hard you work in the US, you will not be rewarded the same way. Recently, this has been highlighted across generational divides between boomers and millennials. Currently, boomers hold 51% of all wealth in the U.S., totaling 70 trillion USD, according to the Federal Reserve in 2023. A study published in November 2023 by researchers from the University of Cambridge, Hamburg University in Germany, and the Paris Institute of Political Studies examined the work and life trajectories of more than 6,000 baby boomers and 6,000 millennials in the U.S. It evaluated and compared the impact of their work and life choices on their wealth by the age of 35. While 62% of the boomers owned homes at 35, for example, only 49% of millennials did. Around 14% of millennials had negative net worth, meaning that their debts outweighed their assets compared with 8.7 of boomers. In addition, for baby boomers, 63% of low-skilled service workers owned their own home at 35 compared with 42% of millennials in the same occupations. The poorest millennials in service sector roles now often have negative net worth, which was less common among boomers. The research published in the American Journal of Sociology describes this widening wealth gap as a fundamental moral and political challenge. Earlier in 2018, Pew Research showed data on how the public is broadly pessimistic about the future of America, with 73% believing the gap between the poor and wealthy will grow in the next few years, and 48% being very worried that our political leaders will not be able to solve the country's biggest problems. Adding on to these studies with the reach of the internet, we can see how university money helps fund genocide on the other side of the world, while our tax money helps give free health care to another colonial empire. Social media has only made it more apparent how far behind the U.S. is with infrastructure, its walkability, housing, car culture, zoning laws, working laws, maternity leave, education costs, and more. And this boils down to what I see as this reconciling of U.S. national identity for mainly young people like myself and others who've grown up through 9-11, the Iraq war, through the 2008 financial crisis, student loan debt, the global pandemic, basically in a constant state of stress, all while we said the Pledge of Allegiance and were indoctrinated into the cult of American exceptionalism the same way as other generations, but who now realize as grown adults that the U.S. isn't all that great. As one commenter wrote, Trump was elected when I was 10, so I didn't really have much of my thinking years fooled into thinking America is perfect. In an age where we can live stream injustices that are happening at the hands of law enforcement and the military and billion dollar corporations, it's just not feasible to keep up this narrative of American exceptionalism any longer, no matter how hard many may try. But how is it that though the U.S. seems to be on the decline and in reality no better and even worse in some aspects than other countries, that those in the U.S. still benefit from living there? And conversely, why do some Americans want to leave and what are the implications of U.S. privilege when immigrating abroad? These are just some of the questions I asked you and want to dive into in this video. The first part of this essay will deal with the history of how the U.S. became an international superpower and empire and the American century that followed, which changed how the world saw the U.S. and how the U.S. saw itself. The next part will dive into how the U.S. controls this narrative that they are the best country in the world and the question of U.S. and imperial privilege. Afterwards, we'll talk about why many Americans have become so dissatisfied with their lives there compared to other countries. And lastly, we'll get into the romanticized your life abroad trend when it comes to Americans living abroad. And before we start, I just want to say thank you to those who did fulfill the survey and your answers will be shared throughout this video. Video. And we'll also be hearing from my friend Nicole who moved to Taiwan from the U.S. to teach English for the past six years and listen to their thoughts on cultural differences and U.S. privilege. Additionally, all the links to my research for this video are in the description below. So grab a drink or a snack, this is going to be a big one. When exactly did the U.S. become a global superpower? 
Well, the short answer is 1898, after the U.S. won the Spanish-American War and seized all of Spain's international territories, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the period of Spanish colonialism and granted possession of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines to the U.S. This was huge considering Spain ruled the Philippines for 333 years. The U.S. also took the opportunity to annex Hawaii in 1898, deposing Queen Lilio Kalani. Those in Puerto Rico, Guam, and Hawaii are still fighting for their independence from the U.S. Empire to this day. So here comes the long answer. America always says they are democratic. Lies! That is a lie! They have never been democratic with native people. They have never been democratic with Indians. They have never been democratic with Hawaiians. The United States of America is the most powerful imperialist country in the world. Before 1898, the U.S. was barely 100 years old, having become independent from England in 1776. The U.S. Civil War, which put an end to the enslavement of black people, ended in 1865, with President Lincoln killed shortly afterward. Leaderless and recovering from war, and with racial tensions running high as black people were still suffering due to sharecropping or new slavery and Jim Crow laws, the nation's leaders weren't putting their focus on being a colonial power themselves just yet. Instead, pre-Civil War and during Reconstruction, the federal government was highly concerned with manifest destiny or stealing land from the native people either by buying it from other colonial powers or going to war for said land and killing and displacing the tribes who lived there for centuries. During the treaty era, which lasted from 1776 to 1820, various European powers and later the U.S. would make agreements with indigenous populations. The United States signed its first treaty with the Delaware tribe in 1778. Often, negotiations and representatives of the U.S. government entered into agreements with tribal nations under false pretenses, securing land sessions from tribes and then going back on their word. As the 1800s continued, the U.S. bought land from European powers on which Native Americans still lived but had no say. The Louisiana Purchase from France was made in 1803, Florida was ceded by Spain in 1819, Texas was annexed by the U.S. in 1845, Oregon was ceded by Great Britain in 1846, California and the neighboring territory was ceded by Mexico in 1848, and the Alaska Purchase was made in 1867. Thus, the U.S. federal government colonized all the way to the Pacific and beyond, which meant the start of the Native American removal era, another phase of the genocide which lasted from 1820 to 1850. The policy goals of the era focused on removing Native Americans from Indian country and moving them west beyond the Mississippi River. Congress codified this policy officially in 1830 with the passage of the Indian Removal Act. Application of the act displaced thousands of Native Americans from their homes. The most infamous displacement was that of the Cherokee, whose march west resulted in the death of over 4,000 tribal members. The death march is commonly referred to as the Trail of Tears, which was overseen by President Andrew Jackson. They go well and they got down. The U.S. military frontiersmen and homesteaders, mainly settlers of Scottish-Irish lineage and their parents and relatives, pioneers of the Alleghenies to Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee, moved in via the Oregon Trail during the Great Oregon Migration of 1843, which promised thousands of descendants of the original colonists as well as new immigrants from Western Europe land at a low cost, all to boost the economy after the disastrous economic panic of 1837, pushing out the indigenous people from their homeland and moving them further and further west. Once the U.S achieved manifest destiny after taking over the entire continental U.S. as well as the contiguous U.S., the displaced indigenous people were then forced into reservations. The reservation era was problematic in terms of tribes' self-determination. While living on reservations, tribal members were policed by federal officers referred to as Indian agents. Congress also interfered in tribal sovereignty with the passage of the Major Crimes Act in 1885. As consequence of the act's passage, tribal nations were no longer able to adjudicate violent felonies such as murder, rape, and kidnapping among their people using traditions, norms, or customs. Instead, the adjudication of such offenses fell under the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government. Months after Jackson was elected, 
the Georgia legislature passed a series of laws taking away the civil rights of Cherokees within their borders. Cherokees could not testify in court. They could not meet in council. Their government was deemed illegal. The editor of the Cherokee newspaper, Elias Boudinot, expressed their outrage. Here is the secret, full license to our oppressors, and every avenue of justice closed to us. Yes, this is the bitter cup prepared for us. Assimilation tactics such as creating a dependence on food rations, kidnapping, and enrolling Native American children in boarding schools and punishing the use of Native languages began to become commonplace in tribal communities. The impacts of this era on Native culture have been devastating and reach well into modernity. Genocide and enslavement are key parts of U.S. history that cannot be overlooked and a huge reason why and how the U.S. became a dominant global superpower. The blood of black, brown, and indigenous people lined the country's founders' pockets, and this extends all the way to present day with billionaires like Bezos, Zuckerberg, and Cook, who all use some form of exploitative labor. Not to mention the owners of U.S. investment firms such as BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, who own 88% of S&P 500 businesses, U.S. and international companies alike. That's trillions upon trillions of dollars, all concentrated and controlled by the U.S. As for foreign policy with European governments, one of the first international conflicts the U.S. had to confront was the French Revolution. The Federalists and Jeffersonians, the two dominant political parties at the time disagreed over U.S. policy towards political events in Europe. After the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, the Federalists distrusted France and encouraged closer commercial ties to England, while the Jeffersonians preferred to support the new French Republic. Conflict in Europe between France and Britain and Spain in the late 1790s resulted in President George Washington declaring American neutrality. And this mindset of neutrality was what the U.S. government went into at the dawn of the 1800s. However, remaining neutral on the world stage proved difficult, especially after Haiti decided to fight for their independence from France and eventually became the second colony in the Americas to assert their sovereignty in 1804. President John Adams decided to provide aid to Louverture against his British-supported rivals. But under President Thomas Jefferson, the United States cut off aid to Louverture and instead pursued a policy to isolate Haiti, fearing that the Haitian Revolution would spread to the U.S. Jefferson refused to recognize Haitian independence. It wasn't until 1862 that the United States recognized Haiti's status as a sovereign independent nation. After this, the U.S. became embroiled in another foreign affair with the War of 1812 against the British, which became known as the Second War for Independence. Then there was, of course, the Civil War, various economic panics, and to end the century, the Spanish-American War of 1898, which, like I said in the short answer, gave away Spanish colonial territories to the U.S., making the U.S. a new international threat. The U.S. ended up killing 20,000 Filipino combatants and civilians in the U.S.-Filipino War from 1899 to 1902. As the Philippines tried fighting for their freedom after Spain lost the Spanish-American War, only to be beaten back with violence, famine, and disease at the hands of their new oppressors. And though the U.S. decided to stay mostly neutral in foreign conflicts during the 1800s, the U.S. had foreigners choosing to come to them. The first wave of immigrants to the U.S. pre-Civil War were mainly German, Irish, English, Canadian, and French. And like you'd expect, the Founding Fathers as well as the recent government loved the idea of immigrants coming to the U.S. to find a new life much like they did. Just kidding, they hated it. It's not what a hate crime is. Well, I hated it! By 1819 economic depression and the worry that Britain might ship their poor to the U.S. tempered Congress's pro-immigration position. In 1819, Congress indirectly regulated immigration under the guise of safety by limiting the number of passengers that a ship could carry based on its tonnage. Give me your tired, hungry, and poor, but only if they weigh in total this exact amount. These immigrants had different cultures and religions, particularly the German craft workers and Irish Catholics, both of which created political backlash and promoted the emergence of nativist political parties. 
Beyond these issues, nativists also worried about wage competition and other welfare programs made for real Americans being used by immigrants. Sound familiar? These Western European immigrants both settled in large cities like New York, but also went on the Oregon Trail west to new U.S. territories, as mentioned before. Then came the second wave during the post-Civil War period. Between 1861 and 1890, 10.4 million immigrants arrived in the U.S., mainly of Southern and Eastern European descent. This wave was more than twice the size of the previous wave, which had 4.9 million immigrants of mostly Northern European descent. By 1890, decades of immigration increased the foreign-born portion of the U.S. population to 14.8%. The Statue of Liberty itself was dedicated on October 28, 1886, and Ellis Island, the immigration entry point on the East Coast, was established in 1892. So how did the U.S. political leaders and intellectuals at the time think to handle this immigration problem? Eugenics, of course. The rise of eugenics during the late 1800s and early 1900s led to a progressive movement in the U.S. in which some progressives argued that immigrants impeded the achievement of an ideal society, committed crimes, and abused welfare. Others proposed that the government had a duty to protect natives, meaning the white people born in the U.S., from immigrants who supposedly depressed innovation and lowered native-born American wages. Anti-immigrant sentiment also prompted the U.S. to block the immigration of Japanese laborers via the informal gentlemen's agreement of 1907 in which Japan would not allow further emigration to the U.S. and the U.S. would not impose restrictions on Japanese immigrants already present in the country. That went well. Preceding this, of course, was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. This act provided an absolute 10-year ban on Chinese laborers immigrating to the U.S. It is the only chapter of the 15 chapters in Title VIII that deals with aliens and nationality that is completely focused on a specific nationality or ethnic group. During the 1900s, eugenic societies were set up around the U.S. in various states. North Carolina's eugenics board operated from 1929 to 1974. Eugenicists believed, like the progressives, that the immigrant population and black population had to be stopped from taking native jobs and government benefits for real Americans. And to enact these practices, they enforced the birth control measures such as forced sterilization. Thousands of black women in the U.S. were sterilized without their consent. In North Carolina, of the 7,600 women who were sterilized by the state between the years of 1933 and 1973... About 5,000 were African American, and in California, African Americans made up just over 1% of the state's population, but they accounted for at least 4% of the total number of sterilization operations conducted by the state between 1909 and 1979. Mexican American women were also the victims of forced sterilization in California, and their victims saw reparations as recently as 1978. In the now famous 1978 case, Madrigal v. Keegan, 10 Chicanas filed a class action lawsuit against physicians at University of Southern California, Los Angeles County Medical Center for sterilizing them without their knowledge or informed consent. The founder of what would become Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, was a eugenicist herself, writing, It is reasonable to assume that women of subnormal mentality, however lacking they may be in vision and altruism, would prefer to avoid the pain and responsibilities of procreation. If the satisfaction of sex could be divorced from reproduction, given birth control, the unfit will voluntarily eliminate their kind. Though Sanger is a controversial figure, Sanger's legacy was enough for a Planned Parenthood branch to remove her name from one of their Manhattan clinics. However, not all progressives at the time believed in eugenics. Walter Lippmann, U.S. journalist and political commentator who coined the word stereotype as we know it today, took on the eugenicists' broadside in the 1920s over everything from immigration and sterilization to IQ tests and education. Lippmann pointed out that the results of the acclaimed Army intelligence tests administered during World War I by Robert M. Yerkers of Harvard and a committed eugenicist started with the assumption that intelligence was inherited and collected test data on recruits 1,700,000 of them. When the data was analyzed by Princeton psychologist Carl Burgum in 1923, he found a startling correlation between length of residence of immigrants in the U.S. and their performance on the tests. Brigham's conclusion with which Yerkers agreed was that the quality of immigrants had been declining for at least several decades. However, Lippmann found that a far more compelling correlation existed between scores on the tests and the number of years of schooling. Lippmann would later write in an essay for Vanity Fair in 1923, 
A heap of nonsense is talked, for example, about the alleged results of the intelligence tests, and it is argued that only a percentage of the population is by nature fitted for secondary and higher education. The real truth is the exact reverse. The real problem which lies at the root of all the different schemes for limiting education is not the scarcity of intelligence, but the scarcity of jobs. The early decades of the 1900s in the U.S. were not only marked by eugenic policies to limit migration and undesired populations, but also World War I, in which the U.S. endured more than 100,000 casualties. After losing the Great War, the U.S. adopted an isolationist policy during the 20s and throughout the 1930s, as proponents of isolationism argued that marginal U.S. interests in that conflict did not justify the number of casualties. As tensions rose in Europe during the early and mid-1930s, Congress pushed through a series of neutrality acts which served to prevent American ships and citizens from becoming entangled in outside conflicts. The U.S. infamously turned away boats of Jewish refugees and asylum seekers from Europe, forcing them to go back to the continent that was set on their destruction. Then President FDR was adamant about taking a stance in Europe and with the Sino-Japanese War. So in 1937, he gave his famous quarantine speech in which he likened international aggression to a disease that other nations must work to quarantine. In the speech, Roosevelt also stated, The peace-loving nations must make a concerted effort in opposition to those violations of treaties and those ignorings of humane instincts, which today are creating a state of international anarchy, international instability, from which there is no escape through mere isolation or neutrality. At that time, however, Americans were still not prepared to risk their lives and livelihoods for peace abroad. Not to mention how they actually believed in eugenics, but... That's another thing. Even the outbreak of war in Europe in 1939 did not suddenly diffuse popular desire to avoid international entanglements. It was the surprise Japanese attack on the U.S. Navy at Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 that served to convince the majority of Americans that the U.S. should enter the war on the side of the Allies. The war would end in 1945. And though the war left behind death, trauma, and unspeakable horrors, as well as started a cold war and ushered in an era of mutually assured destruction, the U.S.'s economy had a financial breakthrough. Would someone please think of the economy? The Second World War almost single-handedly pulled the U.S. out of an economic depression. 17 million new civilian jobs were created, industrial productivity increased by 96%, and corporate profits after taxes doubled. The government expenditures helped bring about the business recovery that had eluded the New Deal. And the U.S. took the opportunity that Europe and East Asia were destroyed to swoop in and become their savior. In 1948, President Truman signed the act that became known as the Marshall Plan. Over the next four years, Congress appropriated $13.3 billion for European recovery. Between 1946 and 1952, Washington invested $2.2 billion or $18 billion real 21st century dollars adjusted for inflation in Japanese reconstruction effort. Not to mention the U.S.'s occupation of Japan post-World War II, as Japan was key geographically in the U.S.'s post-war containment policy. Through these means, the U.S. was able to influence both the Western and Eastern spheres to their liking. In Europe and Asia, the U.S. not only left behind their military presence in the style of Theodore Roosevelt's Great White fleet and talk quietly but carry a big stick motto, they also worked to become the largest exporter of goods and soon the largest economy in the world. With the war finally over, American consumers were eager to spend their money on everything from big ticket items like homes, cars, and furniture to appliances, clothing, shoes, and everything else in between. U.S. factories answered their call beginning with the automobile industry. New car sales quadrupled between 1945 and 1955, and by the end of the 50s, some 75% of American households owned at least one car. In 1965, the nation's automobile industry reached its peak, producing 11.1 million new cars, trucks, and buses, and a accounting for one out of every six American jobs. And this ability to drive out on the open road was helped with the Federal Highway Act of 1956, which connected the entire continental U.S. In some ways, this was the last nail in the coffin for public transportation in the U.S., but we'll get to car dependency later. During the war, 
the U.S. government's Office of Price Administration had encouraged the public to save up their money, ideally buying more bonds for a brighter future. In her book, A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Postwar America, Elizabeth Cohen reported that by 1945, Americans were saving on average of 21% of their personal disposable income compared to just 3% in the 20s. The U.S. post-war thus became a highly sought-after market and also the largest exporter of goods until 2009 when it was overtaken by China. Despite that, today the U.S. is still the largest economy on the planet. When it comes to U.S. home life, the 50s are known for being a golden age if you were a middle-class cis-head able-bodied white man who was able to live the American dream of buying a house with a yard, a car, having a decent paying job, and being able to raise a family. And why did the suburbs see such a boom besides government financial incentives like the GI Bill? White flight. White people purposely left the crowded post-war cities to go and find refuge in these all-white utopias. Black people in particular couldn't buy into this American dream, and many suburban towns were sundown towns, where black people as well as Jewish people couldn't be out after dark. Going to the U.S. sundown town database, many write how there were banners hanging around their town declaring this is a homogeneous neighborhood. A former mayor of Hamilton Township in New Jersey said this about the town's history. There were no black people allowed after dark in the Maze Landing Village section of the township, with the exception of the town barber. Instead, everyone of color was required to live, and to this day many still do, live about five miles west in the mitzvah section of the township. They were informal restrictions, but they existed. Today, the boomers of the 50s and 60s that are the wealthiest are white people who inherited their families' homes in the once middle-class suburbs, but which are now highly sought-after areas. Two-bedroom, two-bath suburban homes that were $8,000 in the 50s which is around $100,000 today, are now selling for half a million dollars. If you didn't have that privilege to create wealth for yourself and your descendants back in the 50s and 60s, today you're essentially screwed. And though I pointed out how this American dream was attainable, like mainly for white families, it didn't necessarily make them all happy like you think it would. Women were forced back into the home as homemakers and housewives. There were no marital rape laws. LGBTQ plus people lived in the closet, veteran war trauma wasn't addressed, and in general, commuting sucked, life was dictated by strict gender norms, the ramifications of the suburbs are still ones we're feeling to this day. Though I'm sure some people are happy, not everyone has the same dream, and you can't dictate someone's dream for them. The perfect vision of the 1950s and early 60s America was even turned on its head during its own contemporary time, from the Twilight Zone to Revolutionary Road to Catcher in the Rye, and the Addams Family TV series, even people living in that era realized it was far from what it seemed. But overall, the U.S. to its majority white citizens, as well as to the world on an international stage, marketed itself as living up to its ideals and the best place on earth with the happiest place on earth. By the mid to late 60s, East Asia and Western Europe had started to recover financially, exporting Beatlemania and other English and European culture to the U.S., as well as Japanese electronics and cars, threatening U.S. superiority. In addition, social unrest and the largely unpopular Vietnam War, which many young people rebelled against, burning draft cards, protesting the U.S.'s violence overseas, and the psychological toll it had on teenagers started to tear down this facade of the perfect country. Since the 60s, the social inequality in the U.S. has become impossible to ignore. From large deficit spending due to needless wars, to political polarization, to turning a blind eye to the AIDS crisis, to the wealth gap, to a new enemy seemingly lurking around every corner, it seems like we've been spiraling since the 50s. But were we ever really at the top... I mean, with all this cultural and historical baggage that we've been talking about, how could we ever say we were the best? A large military and economy doesn't a good country make. Well, when it comes to doomsday and declinism, many cultural critics say it's just part of American culture. Kenneth Weisbrod, a historian, wrote in 2016, American culture has long been an aspirational one, so fear of decline is always around the corner. And U.S. historian David A. Bell wrote in 2010... For whatever reason, it is clear that for more than half a century, many America's leading commentators have had a powerful impulse consistently to see the U.S. as a weak, spread-out basket case that will fall to stronger rivals as inevitably as Rome fell to the barbarians. We would do a bit better to recognize that calling ourselves the New Romans is really just a seductive fantasy, and that our political and economic problems demand political and economic solutions, not exercises in collective moral self 
flagellation. In other words, even declaring our own inevitable downfall or current decline means that we have somewhere high to fall from. That even despite the ways the government fails its citizens, we occupy a lofty position akin to ancient Rome, at least to some. So let's look into it. Continent! I don't know. Where Brazil is. You hear about what's going on in Ukraine? Oh yeah, but like the Ukraine-Russian war? Yes, there's a war. So where is Ukraine? <laughs> That's a great question. Antarctica. <laughs> That's a continent. Help! So before we talk about privilege, we have to understand where this notion that the U.S. is the best country in the world even comes from. Since, as we've discussed historically, the U.S. is one of the worst countries when it comes to how it treats its own people and those abroad. Well, one of the main reasons the U.S. is dubbed the best country in the world is because of its massive economy in a capitalistic world where the bottom line is valued more than human lives, this is important. Therefore, by pushing capitalism to its limits, the U.S. has become financially well off by stealing and exploiting land rich in natural resources and is now a large exporter of oil and the second biggest exporter of goods in the world. The U.S. is the wealthiest country on earth and this positively impacts most if not everyone who lives there in many ways, primarily in that the income disparity in the U.S. is lower when compared to the rest of the world, but specifically when compared with the global south. However, when it comes to comparing the U.S. to other wealthy countries, the U.S. fails in many ways, and this is true even when compared to some lower income countries, as we'll talk about later. Moving on, the U.S. has one of the highest human development indexes and overall standard of living, and according to the OECD, the U.S. has the highest disposable income per capita. The dollar is also an extremely strong currency when paired against the Brazilian hal, for example, with a 1 to 5 ratio, and with the Chinese yuan with a 1 to 7 ratio. This factor alone is a huge reason why the U.S. is a desired country to immigrate to, as many immigrants work to send money back to their home countries. Additionally, the way of social mobility is also greater in the U.S. and the imperial core than countries that have been and continue to be exploited for the core's gain. One responder put it as such, The idea of U.S. privilege is inseparable from imperial core privilege. The relationship and power compared to nations globally affords a level of security that comes with belonging to these countries rather than not. Despite the innumerable coups that the U.S. has overseen, there isn't a realistic fear of a Burma or Syria returning the favor. The U.S. will support and help arm Saudi Arabia in their assault on Yemen, but would never think to support Denmark in a plan to bomb Norway, to borrow an example from Rashna Bachiwala Singh. Sitting down with Nicole Cooper, a U.S. citizen living in Taiwan, she talked about how anti-blackness affects how black people are seen abroad and how that also intersects with U.S. American privilege. There's a lot of foreigners from African countries and I think right now in some in some European countries, a lot of people are feeling the type of way about a lot of people from Africa and a lot of people from the Middle East who are migrating into those countries, and they have they'll have uh, low opinions of them. So, so for someone like me, if I go there, they can't really tell where I'm from just by looking at me. So maybe they'll assume like, oh, that's just another African migrant. So let me be rude to them, and then they hear me talk, and they just and then they hear my accent, and they're just like, oh. Hi, how are you? There's also the fact that the U.S. has shaped the world in its image, and those who live there receive those benefits and are able to move throughout the globe as number one. And the U.S. really is number one in that the international area code for the U.S. is number one, whereas for Brazil it's 55 and China it's 86. Those in the U.S. also don't need to add a country code to websites like .com.br for Brazil or .com.in for India. The U.S.'s dominant language is also English, which we've imposed on the rest of the world through colonialism, Hollywood music, video games, etc not to mention with the help from our good friends, the British. Therefore, we can enjoy most popular global media in its original language and also can travel to most countries and not be completely lost. Whereas in other countries where English isn't a dominant language, they have to rely on travel groups and guides and services to even think about going abroad. It really is a privilege to just know English. <laughs> One commenter responded, even being born in an English-speaking country could be considered a privilege as it's a dominant language in many fields. Another 
another wrote, speaking English as your first and potentially only language is a privilege, especially when so many other countries make an effort to cater to English speakers. Many of you also pointed out how powerful U.S. passports are. I've seen so many people say how difficult it is for them to travel to certain countries because of their passport and because of misconceptions people have about their country. Additionally, there's no stronger nation than the U.S. when it comes to military power. Maybe Russia or China, but even if there was an attack on the U.S., we have wealthy allies who would come to our aid. The rest of the world sits on edge at what the U.S. government will do to them and their people miles and miles away. But we don't need to worry about another country or government doing that to us. Next, there are certain luxuries that exist throughout the U.S. that, though not everyone has access to, they are seemingly normal to have if you do live in the U.S. Firstly, there's a dryer for your clothes. Whereas most places in the world use clotheslines to dry their clothes, the U.S. has dryers. Secondly, hot water on tap. Most places in the world require you to buy an electric shower head to have hot water. And most sinks around the world. Don't have hot water built into them. Thirdly, washing machines for your dishes. The U.S. is one of the biggest importers and producers of washing machines or dishwashers, I should say. Whirlpool, which is a U.S. company, is the largest manufacturer. And lastly, plumbing infrastructure that lets you flush toilet paper. In some places in the world, like Brazil, you can't flush your dirty toilet paper and instead need to put it in a garbage can. And whether you think drying machines or dishwashers are a good thing or not depends on who you ask, but they are. Are definitely unique things to the U.S., though they have spread through many other higher-income countries. Personally, as much as I think these luxuries are important, I'd rather have universal health care and paid maternity leave. And a walkable city rather than a dishwasher. But I also don't think that we should be forced to make this trade-off in the first place. One of the most obvious ways U.S. privilege manifests, and why this notion that the U.S. is the best country in the world exists to begin with, is propaganda and Hollywood, aka the U.S.'s soft power. In fact, one of the most defining aspects to people outside of the U.S., as represented in the survey, was Hollywood and U.S. films. I grew up being exposed to Hollywood films that show the U.S. as a shiny and prosperous country where everyone is doing absolutely great, which is basically the entire opposite of the poor third world Southeast Asian country I was born into. And when asked if those outside the U.S. ever wanted to travel or visit the U.S., the majority answer was. Yes, many people outside of the U.S. grow up immune to the U.S.'s propaganda, especially if you've been personally victimized by the U.S. But it's no doubt inescapable, as Hollywood tends to infiltrate box offices and streaming services around the world, whether you like it or not. On the other hand, there has been a sort of democratization element of streaming, so it's getting better. But the power of the U.S. nostalgic sitcoms like Friends, Gilmore Girls, The Big Bang Theory, are undeniable in exporting a certain je ne sais quoi that makes the U.S. look cool, even fun. <laughs> From book talk with Colleen Hoover's books translated into various languages worldwide, to Disney's media monopoly, to Taylor Swift being a global superstar with billions of streams, the way the U.S. has been able to brand itself as cool is one of the best marketing campaigns in the world. There's the romanticization of mid-century Americana by the likes of Lana Del Rey's Born to Die era, Katy Perry's California Girls, the country pastoral aesthetics of The Climb, and even Lady Gaga's American flag aesthetic for Telephone. Historically, like we've discussed in Part One, World War II played a huge role in how the U.S. was seen globally. After World War II, the U.S. rewrote the narrative that they came in and saved Europe and Japan, cared about peace and immigrants, while ignoring the fact that they also inspired many of Hitler's own eugenicist and anti-Semitic beliefs. Forced sterilizations in the U.S. were so widespread and disturbingly effective that Hitler himself reportedly told a Nazi colleague that, "quote I have studied with interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny, in all probability, would be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock." World War II was pivotal to the U.S.'s rebrand and explains why there's so much alternate history media about that era, from Wolfenstein to the plot against America to the man in the high castle. It really changed the nation forever. Now we had a bad guy, a villain figure. Whether it be the Nazis or the Commies, to make ourselves look good in comparison, the U.S. was able to erase its own hypocrisy. So when history gets taught to U.S. schoolchildren, they come out the victor. 
All of this from the numbers and figures indicating the U.S.'s overall higher standard of living to the biased way the U.S. advertises its culture and history culminates in this idea that the U.S. is the best country and therefore the people who live there enjoy, like we said, a lofty position. The U.S. does suck, but I guess it sucks less, at least like many of you mentioned compared to countries in the global south, but when compared to their western wealthy European and Scandinavian peers, not so much. But in the end, I think it's a really slippery slope to start comparing suffering from country to country, especially if you're from the U.S. going on and on about how great it is that you live in the U.S. compared to those shitholes. It not only comes off as offensive to people from the global south and helps to reinforce this dangerous notion that the U.S. is just objectively the best country in the world, it's also insensitive to your fellow Americans who are struggling and being terrorized by police and gun violence and anti-trans laws, etc. As one commenter put it, I definitely think there are some exceptions to our privilege, especially if you're talking about indigenous people. I don't know if you've ever been on a reservation, but they're made intentionally horrible by our federal government. Speaking of Flint, several reservations in the Southwest are poisoned by water because of mining runoff. It's never been fixed and it's been going on since the 1970s in some places. And though some writers and cultural critics may argue that even if you're stuck in the bottom 5% of the U.S. income bracket, your standard of living is about equal to that of the top 5% of Indians, you're still poor. And though I think it might be humbling for some people in the U.S. to hear that there are starving people in China. Brandy, would you eat? There are starving people in China. At the end of the day, I think these types of remarks make the person receiving them more resentful than anything else. These remarks of how at least you're not in X country helps to worsen global solidarity by playing into some sort of like oppression Olympics of who has it worse and by making it out as if being poor or being marginalized in the US is some sort of picnic and therefore they should just shut up about it. What we can say, however, is that yes, U.S. privilege and imperial core privilege is real on a global scale. There's so many benefits from living in the imperial core than outside of it. Better to live in the country that's doing the bombing than in the country that's being bombed. But we shouldn't use that as a justification to further push this idea that the U.S. is objectively better than other countries, nor use it to shut down marginalized groups living in the U.S. itself. In the last part, we discussed some ways in which the U.S. has benefits compared to other countries. So in this section, I want to dive into some differences between the U.S. and the rest of the world and why they make the U.S. population so unhappy, even though they're seen as the American standard that everyone should be striving towards. Firstly, zoning laws and car culture. As someone who was raised in the U.S. in a very sheltered white suburban neighborhood, I think it was easy as a kid to believe that the U.S. was the best country in the world. When you grow up in a town where being homeless is illegal with vagrancy laws, where most people are wealthy and white financiers who go on ski trips and cruises every winter and summer, you grow up in this kind of bubble where everything is seemingly perfect. You don't even have to think about people who live in poverty in your own country, let alone on the other side of the world. Since if you want to, you never have to leave your zip code. You can just go from home to school to work and home again, which is very different from the rest of the world where zoning laws for suburbia aren't really a thing and therefore you experience more diversity. In fact, most countries have businesses and homes intermixed so people can walk to places as not everyone has a car. And though we like to think of European cities with their public transit and walkability, Brazil, where I live, is very similar. Businesses and houses are next to each other. You can even walk to a convenience store, salon, or bakery from your apartment or home. In the U.S., zoning ordinances can restrict or entirely ban specific kinds of businesses from operating in an area. You might have fewer zoning restrictions if you base your business out of your home, but zoning ordinances can still apply even to home-based businesses. Remember it being impossible for Michael Scott to start a business in his condo? In general, not having strict zoning laws makes life easier not only for small shop owners, but also for the general public as you don't need to drive to pick up dish soap. It's at your local 
local bodega. And this convenience lies in major cities as well as small rural towns, though I'd argue that in Brazil there is a strong car culture which means roads are mainly for vehicles, but unlike the US, there's still public transit options and motor taxis. Motorcycles are crucial for everyday life in Brazil as well as in other countries in the global south as they're used as taxis, delivery vehicles, and are cheaper than cars. Motorcycles in the US stereotypically are for biker gangs or seen as a luxury to show off with friends rather than actually be marketed as practical. They're seen as a toy. One of the biggest complaints of why young people today in the US are disenchanted by the American dream I've seen is because of this car-centric culture that forces you into isolation and that is wholly unaffordable in today's world. People don't want to buy a car that'll end up polluting the planet and that's an unnecessary expense if their towns just invested in buses, streetcars, or trolleys. Car culture forces us to use our hard-earned income on buying something the state should be providing for little to no cost. Not to mention how you're basically giving everyone a death machine. Cars cause so many deaths, so much pollution, so much waste, so much class division, but as long as it stimulates the economy, right? It's not only car culture, but just how empty and lifeless downtown suburbia feels, as strip malls have no cultural history or significance to them, at least not anymore. When it comes to city centers, Most U.S. suburban centers are boxy strip malls with the same national chain stores you could find anywhere else. There's a chain supermarket, a Target, an Ulta, Starbucks, or Chipotle, and maybe a deserted Froyo place. Though there's some unique strip malls and higher-end strip malls depending on where you live, it's usually just the same setup with a huge parking lot in the middle that takes 10 minutes or more to walk across in and of itself. Can you imagine walking to a strip mall? Rather than having a lot of small specialized businesses in a town or city center, Most stores in the U.S. are big box chain stores and restaurants. These larger conglomerates have taken over local businesses or absorbed specialized businesses into one huge store. They simply become a place to spend money and leave. And this leads us to the lack of third spaces in suburbia and how they also lead to this feeling of isolation and loneliness. Most people get in their car, go to work or school, and then come home, and then your whole life goes by and you don't even know who lives next door to you. Third spaces where you don't have to spend money are limited to the library, parks on good days, and some museums. Of course, there's cafes and small eating establishments, but you still have to spend money. One thing you could do in suburbia is take a walk with friends and maybe find a nearby bench to sit on, but it's even hard to do that with the lack of sidewalks and where roads are made for cars and not pedestrians. I recently went back to the US and the size of the cars some people are driving is actually disgusting. You can't even see kids who might be crossing the street in front of you. Car culture also takes away from third places because with public transport as a third place, you could catch up with friends on their commute either on a bus or walk into them while they're waiting at a bus stop or trolley stop like a bench area. You have the chance to start and end the day together instead of sitting in traffic alone. In other countries, there are third spaces like in the U.S. with parks, cafes, museums, libraries, etc., but also public squares. And in Brazil, we have the calçadão or big sidewalk in Portuguese where people sit on benches and stoops outside of their homes and talk in the evening after the workday. Not only does it cost nothing to sit and talk and people watch in a public square or large sidewalk area with benches, it also helps that these squares and sidewalks are mixed-use spaces and not zoned just for housing or just for businesses. There's homes intermixed with businesses, so someone might be running an errand and happen to see you sitting on a nearby bench, and this leads to having, you know, spontaneous run-ins with your community members. People in Brazil as well as other countries also take advantage of their front porches or sidewalks slash street areas and use them as places of socialization. So you might be walking your dog and stop to talk to a neighbor who's sitting with their family outside enjoying the night air. Of course, a lot of this also has to do with climate and time of year, but I think it's better to have more third spaces where you don't have to spend money than less. Another difference between the U.S. and the rest of the world is the length of their school day. In the U.S., the average school day for students is just under seven hours a day with a 40-minute lunch break. In other countries like Finland, Germany, and Brazil, it's around five hours, with Germany having the shortest school day at just four and a half hours. Though in Brazil, some schools now have full school days from 7.30 in the morning to 5 in the evening, usually only half of the day is dedicated to the classroom, while the other half is for recreational activities and clubs and study hall to help kids with homework. 
One reason why Brazil's school day is shorter isn't just because it's better for kids not to be in school the whole day, but because the government doesn't actually have enough money to give kids free lunches. And in some corrupt cases, a mayor was even caught stealing money that was supposed to go to the free school lunches. However, I am a strong advocate for school to remain half a day and wish this would be adopted in the US. On the other hand, it is really helpful for parents who need to work full time and who don't have family members helping out or alternative options. Though the public school system in Brazil specifically isn't seen as good for various reasons, when it comes to the length of the school day, I agree with Brazil and Germany and Finland and other countries that have shorter school days. One topic that came up a lot in the survey as to why the US is viewed as being on the decline is because of student loan debt and how that affects the economy, individuals, and the workforce. And though we like to look at countries in Scandinavia and Europe, South America also has free federally and state-funded universities. And at least in Brazil, these universities are seen as the best in the nation and are highly competitive. On the other hand, because of this, it's not easy for just anyone to get in and there's a lot of class and racial factors that make it not the most equal opportunity, but it does exist compared to the US where you have to pay for a college degree and get into mounds and mounds of debt over it. Though it's important to note that simply the existence of something doesn't make it efficient or good. For example, in Brazil and other countries, healthcare is free, but in Brazil in particular, it's drastically underfunded and overcrowded, and many people who are able to afford it go with the private option instead. But at least there is a public option with free hospitals, free doctor consultations, free medicine at the public pharmacy, as well as other social programs and benefits. I read a lot of comments saying how great social services are in the U.S. as a reason why those in the U.S. are privileged, which is true as the U.S. spends higher than the 20% OECD average on social protection with the U.S. spending 22% of their GDP on welfare. However, Brazil, a country in the global south, spent 17% of their GDP on welfare. And when it comes to government revenues as a share of GDP, Brazil and Canada are on par with each other as they both have publicly funded healthcare. Though most people's first thought is that the US has better social assistance than countries in the global south, that's not always true. As one commenter wrote, the thing that shocks me the most about the US is the practical non-existence of social security systems, the lack of public health care and labor law, the wealth disparity, and the unaffordability of higher education. Throughout the world, Brazil included, a 30-day paid vacation period is mandatory as well as six months of paid maternity leave. The U.S. has no paid maternity leave and only 11 paid vacation days a year. How the money is distributed and the amount of political corruption as well as the strength of the currency all comes into play, but I think it's unfair to make a blanket statement that the U.S. has better social assistance programs 100% across the board because they're in the global north. I think it's important that we fight against this perception that the global south is inferior to the U.S. and that the U.S. is only inferior to Scandinavian and Western European countries because that's not always true. As one commenter wrote in, having lived in both the U.S. and the Caribbean, I can say with complete certainty, I feel more privileged living in the Caribbean. Education is basically free compared to the U.S. and healthcare is also free. Obviously, we have many unresolved issues, but there's no doubt in my mind that I live a better life here than I did in the U.S. The next topic is less pressing but I want to discuss fashion and the way Americans dress. I think we have all seen those TikTok comparisons of international students going to class versus their American peers, and it is really true. When I was in high school and even in college, I hung out with a lot of international students, and they were always dressed up, and us American students were always so surprised. Whether from Europe, Asia, or South America, these students went out in their best jeans, their best sweaters, boots, hats, and always had some makeup on compared to us Americans who just throw on a pair of sweats with their high school logo and slippers and call it a day. And honestly though, I'm one of those American slobs, like I just can't be bothered to dress up or care too much about my outward appearance. But oftentimes I wonder why that is. Why is it that we in the U.S. don't bother dressing up like the rest of the world seemingly does? Do we just like being comfortable? I got a lot of reverse culture shock recently when I saw so many American women wearing sneakers, just like casually. Was this always a thing? And in some ways, I like that in the U.S. It's just acceptable to walk around in your pajamas at the supermarket or at your local strip mall. But in other ways, I really appreciate that the rest of the world, or at least seemingly the rest of the world, hasn't given up on trying to beautify themselves and make going out, even to get your kids from school or go to class, an event. There are downsides, like I do find needing to dress up 
up, at least here in Brazil, a bit annoying as it's something that's just expected of you and not a choice. Not to mention it makes some people focus on vanity a bit too much. Like there's a lot more focus on how you look in Brazil, like how beautiful you are that I never really experienced in the US. There are downsides and upsides to both, but let me know what you think down in the comments below. Another trend I see online when I watch videos comparing the US to other countries is when it comes to the quality of food and the accessibility of good food. There's a lot of viral videos about how I lost X amount of weight in Europe in a week because the food is just so much healthier. Is it the food or did you just live in a walkable city for a week and were on your feet a lot? Or is it both? Honestly, the sugar lobby in the US is so strong along with the dairy lobby, read the cheese caves and government cheese. It just really hinders how healthy our foods in the US can even be. It's almost impossible not to gain weight in the US if you don't really restrict dairy and sugar because there's just so much of it in our food. From sugary breakfast foods to bread to our extremely large coffees, it's everywhere. White rice has also been talked a lot about recently and in the US, white rice is seen as being bad for you. But how can it be when it's a staple in cultures around the world? I also think that US food culture can be really toxic with salads being seen as a meal and the only kind of like healthy food you can eat are fruits and vegetables and everything else is bad for you when that's not true. In our conversation, Nicole mentioned how in Taiwan, due to religious reasons, vegetarian options are built into the cuisine, but how they've also been influenced by US health crazes like the impossible burger but yeah so they have so they do have vegetarian food built into their cuisine but i noticed at that particular restaurant as like the whole impossible burger became a craze in the west they added it to their menu brazil ranks 86 in the most obese countries in the world and they eat a lot of white rice daily and rarely eat pre-made salads or health foods while the u.s ranks 30th but i do think it's really not that helpful to rank countries on this scale as obesity has so many different factors but what we can say is that food from the u.s isn't the healthiest unless you want to spend a lot of money on it six percent or 19 million people in the u.s live in food deserts where they don't have access to a supermarket. Instead, they're forced to buy food from dollar stores and other places that don't sell fresh produce, but rather sugar-packed industrialized food. You'd think that in rural, low-income areas, poor people would have access to fresh farm food, but in fact, they're usually employed as low-wage laborers to harvest the produce and who aren't allowed to eat it. The poorest Americans, 1.5 million families, including 3 million children, survive on cash incomes of no more than 2 dollars per person per day even if they had access to fresh food what could that buy them literally the monster that is the u.s economy demands farmers throw away millions of potatoes you can't even house homeless people without being tried as a criminal for doing so as far as the food quality bananas and eggs in brazil are particularly more tasty than in the u.s at least they're richer in flavor and also last longer. A banana in the US goes bad if it gets one little bruise, but you can open a brown banana in Brazil and it's still white inside. Not to mention you don't need to refrigerate everything here. You don't need to put butter in the fridge, eggs, produce, bread, etc. Though I feel like what you do refrigerate depends on who you are as an individual. It is important to note that in other countries like France as well, they don't refrigerate eggs or bread. You have to refrigerate eggs and milk or else it will go bad. In France, you don't need to put eggs in the fridge and it's safe. I'm not sure why it's not in other countries. And the milk is pasteurized, so you just need to keep it cold once it's open. Portion sizes, in addition, are a lot smaller in the rest of the world compared to the US, and people don't have room to stockpile industrialized food in their home. On the other hand, not needing to stockpile food is easier to do when you have access to fresh food. Back home in North America, we would go to the grocery store, park our car, go inside, get a huge load of groceries once a week and then take them home and have them. Here in Paris, you go to the market at least once a day, if not twice, to just get little things here and there. Moving on to entitlement and American society, one trend I noticed while reading the responses is that I think many in the US are becoming fed up with how hostile their fellow peers are and how they ironically don't feel free. A form of the word individuality or individualism was found over 40 times in your responses. And this attitude becomes even more apparent and glaring with those who don't speak English. Hollywood. Hollywood like I'm not familiar with that. No, no. Hollywood. The Hollywood. <laughs> My God. You mean Hollywood. Duh. Wood. Duh. Duh. It's, yeah. it's back that way. 
<laughs> we love to be the country of immigrants and acceptance until we actually meet an immigrant. This kind of like get out of my way attitude is something that's extremely off-putting to me, but that I never really thought to think about until I left the US. But whenever I go back, I dread random passerbys getting up in my business, whether it be someone yelling at me to get out of the way or it's your turn in the grocery line or a loud and unnecessary excuse me. It's just the rudeness of it all that really irks me, and we think the French are mean. I had a friend from Europe in high school that said Americans are like peaches, soft on the outside and hard on the inside, while Europeans are like pineapples, hard on the outside but sweet on the inside. I think in the US we like the appearance of politeness and small talk, like how are you? But in reality, no one cares. And just to end this section, I want to acknowledge that I hate the Brazil a lot and didn't delve heavily into the downsides, but that's because I feel like those are already really well known to the rest of the world and get highlighted more than the positives. And I just want to talk about the positive aspects that don't get enough attention. Brazil already suffers from a mongrel complex or complexo de viralata, which basically is an inferiority complex Brazilians grow up with in that they think that everything in Brazil sucks. And though there is a lot of suffering in Brazil, wage and racial disparity, as well as government corruption from the municipal level to the federal level, it's also not the full story. Brazil and its people are welcoming and friendly and nice, and there's just so much nature and culture. You just have to experience it for yourself. Hashtag come to Brazil. Donde es a pão de azúcar? Onde é o pão de açúcar? É. <laughs> I feel like whenever you compare the US to another country, but especially to a country in the global south, you're immediately on the defensive and you have to give all these caveats and can see that obviously the US is better. Whereas if you're comparing the US to a Western European or Scandinavian country, it's like, oh, of course the US sucks compared to Norway or whatever. And that's just kind of shitty to me. And I want to kind of try to defamiliarize ourselves with this conversation. I could go on and on about the strange differences between the US and the rest of the world, but I'll bring it back to the intro and end this section with just one word, soccer. <laughs> So now that we've talked about how unhappy and disillusioned people are with the US despite imperial privilege, we now have to discuss the final form of this topic, which is moving abroad. As this Twitter user pointed out, now people from the US are realizing they can immigrate too. The Association of American Residents Abroad, as Americans hate calling themselves immigrants, believes that at least 4.5 million Americans live abroad in 2023. Hell, I've been calling people from the US Americans this whole video, and I'm sure I'm going to get a million comments about that, but that's a whole other can of worms. Anyway, counter to this, a 2019 study of 2,000 Americans revealed that 40% have never left the country and over half have never owned a passport, compared to my viewer survey where almost 70% of you have traveled outside of the country. Though, many of you did say Canada and just for a brief amount of time, others have been all over the world as far as Japan, Finland, and Central and South America like the DR and Ecuador. Many Americans not having a passport or traveling internationally is mainly due to the fact that it's really expensive to travel and it's inaccessible to many Americans, especially nowadays. According to a 2023 survey conducted by payroll.org, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, a 6% increase from the previous year of 2022. As someone who's lived in Brazil since 2017, I've definitely had my share of culture shocks and romanticized my life moments, but in reality, I've come to the conclusion that life is life is life is life. There are good and bad things about living in Brazil, but in general, it's just another place on earth. In some ways, it's easy to romanticize my life in Brazil because I'm from the US. I have that US privilege when people learn I'm American and speak English. It's a big deal. On the other hand, not looking stereotypically American, I get a lot of rude and racist comments about where I'm really from and a lot of other assumptions. But honestly, that's not really unique to Brazil. And I blame the US Hollywood propaganda for making white people the face of of the United States. But in general, as a US citizen who immigrated to Brazil who benefited from a colonial empire and still has class privilege living in Brazil, I have it pretty good and I'm also aware of the privilege I have and I do my best to try to showcase parts about Brazil that are again lesser known as this type of like 
influencer that I am. I think it's important to note how far your US privilege gets you outside of the country depends on what race you are, especially with anti-blackness being global and if the country you're in is LGBTQ plus friendly. And though many from the US immigrate to Europe, Asia, and South America with good intentions, there are also those who immigrate with bad intentions. You might have seen in the news that white straight men are very disgruntled with the dating scene and marriage scene in the US and this leads them to going abroad, or at least some of them, flexing their dollars in third world countries, opening businesses that push out the locals and trying to find a partner and sometimes even participating in sex tourism. Some passport bros or American men think that women from the global south will fall to their feet because they're American and purposefully go out and try to find gullible victims to live out their sexist fantasy. This way of thinking is extremely infantilizing to the women and totally underestimates women's intelligence, not to mention just in general predatory and gross. And this was even touched on with the character of Gloria in Modern Family, who, though loves her American husband Jay, realizes that people in the US see her as dumb because they can only understand her in English or they just see her as someone who wanted to immigrate to the US and is like this gold digger. And this isn't even to go into the abuse and trafficking of children in the global south to foreigners who purposely go there with the intent to hurt them. I think this is the crux of white imperial core privilege at work. US tourists and sometimes even people who work with the UN can abuse children in the global south, but Brittany Griner gets detained in Russia for carrying a vape. This imperial core US privilege has so many sides and layers, but it's racial as well as depends on where you go. Russia is the US's biggest enemy and biggest rival, so they have an upper hand there. But countries like Brazil, Thailand, and Indonesia can't negotiate for tourists to stop coming as their economy is heavily based on tourism by those in the global north, and thus they have an even harder time apprehending the foreign perpetrators. Apart from this, you have white Americans flocking to El Salvador to become crypto bros. It's like the Emily in Paris disaster times a thousand, but it's actually real. Romanticizing your life abroad as an American, but especially if you're in a country in the global south, that has historically been exploited is dangerous waters to be in because it's too easy to forget that real people live there and are struggling and maybe your crypto business and sex tourism is part of the problem. In addition, I don't like when these videos play into some sort of self-fulfillment journey or fantasy and this especially goes for Americans living in countries that are just usually romanticized by Americans like France, Japan, and Scotland, particularly Edinburgh, where people may gloss over the very real negative aspects of those places and cities. When it comes to romanticizing Japan, a huge aspect of it is that it's so safe for women in particular when Japan has lenient laws against sex offenders, not to mention a sexist culture. A lot of these influencers never report the full story because it doesn't fall into a clean narrative. It's either here's everything that's great in this city or here's everything that's wrong with little to no nuance, because how much nuance can you get in a 30 second to one minute reel? Not to mention, many of these influencers are upper class, so they'd be fine in most places around the world. Don't know how the average person lives, and in the end, are just using the country or city as a prop to look cool. I think what irks me even more about these types of posts is when they say how cheap it is to live in X place, but they put the currency in dollars because that'll seem cheap to their American audience, as if the country is only worth visiting or moving to because of how easy it is to exploit. And at times this works the other way too. Like when immigrants to the US, mainly wealthy people in Brazil who moved to Florida, show how cheap it is to live in the US where you can get an iPhone and have an SUV. And you just have to watch these things more critically and know that no, it's not cheap to live in the US. And just because you can buy an iPhone doesn't mean all your problems go away. Or that everyone who immigrates to the US will be able to buy one either. Are we really using iPhones and luxury goods to prove that we've made it? I don't know, I just think that when you watch these types of move abroad videos, you have to use your critical thinking skills. On the other hand, I get it, romanticizing your life is really fun, especially in short aesthetic videos. I mean, you can literally romanticize anything with the right filter. But in all, I just think it's better to walk on the edge of caution and respect. In this video, we've delved into a lot of topics from how the US became a global superpower through war, genocide, slavery, and exploitation to how it was able to rebrand itself into the best country in the world. Lastly, we talked about present day imperial core privilege and US privilege 
why people are so fed up with the U.S. and the various dynamics of U.S. privilege once you start living abroad. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned something new and I'd love to hear what you thought about it down below. Give this video a like or share and thank you so much to my lovely patrons for making this video possible. It was truly a labor of love and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.